Welcome to a ride on the outside. MMA is full of people on the inside, but what about the ones that watch from beyond? Welcome to the MMA Outsiders with Tom Albano and Zan Bando on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Here we go. Welcome to MMA Outsiders episode number four. That's Sam Bando. I'm Tom Albano. Another week of MMA action is coming up after a very quiet weekend where there really wasn't much. We had one championship, new one champion in Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. The flyweight goat does it again. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the weird KSI stuff that happened over the weekend in mm-hmm. boxing. We'll talk, of course, about UFC Paris. Again, I'm Tom Albano, contributor at Fans Out at MMA. That's where you can find my work. You can find Zan's work over at bjpen.com. And Down make, below. Yep. And make sure you hit like and subscribe and make sure you follow all of our socials. You'll see them scrolling across the little ticker on the bottom as the show goes along. However, we do have to start today's episode, Zan, with some news that has been breaking over the last 24 hours or so. Jake Paul, Anderson Silva are in discussions for an October boxing bout. Of course, Jake Paul was set to face Haseem Rahman Jr. a couple months back. That fight ended up not happening, and we'll get into Haseem Rahman Jr. and what's next for him in a little bit. He is on today's show as well Uh, he'll be part of the discussion but jake paul his next fight is the former longtime ufc middleweight champion the ufc legend and well should be hall of famer within the next few years uh anderson silva as you know zan has uh taken up boxing ever since his time with the ufc came to an end at the end of 2020 he ended up in 2021 fighting Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., fought Tito Ortiz, fought, an, fought an exhibition bout in, uh, I believe, Abu Dhabi or Dubai. That sounds, that, that sounds right. Mm-hmm. It, was, uh, it was Abu Dhabi or Dubai a few months back. And now, apparently, he's going to be the next opponent for Jake Paul. So, Zan, your <sighs> initial reaction to this after 24 hours of this news. Yeah, I mean, I could see this coming. People have been talking about this fight for a couple months now. Um, if, if you follow Dana White closely, he had said in several interviews that if Jake Paul wanted to fight somebody legit, Anderson Silva would definitely be down to fight him. He's actually been saying that ever since Anderson Silva left the UFC, and now this fight is looking much closer to happening. And I actually do think that this is Jake Paul's toughest test, not just because that Anderson Silva was an MMA legend. It's the fact that Anderson Silva is continuing to get better with age, no matter what type of combat sport he goes into. And I'm sure he's going to take this Jake Paul fight very seriously. And I actually think he has the tools to finish him. So I really hope that they can get this fight done. I think it would be a massive fight. It would be big for Showtime. I know Dana likes to make fun of Showtime all the time. And they don't really have too many big fights, which to an extent he's, he's correct and that sentiment, I think this is good for all parties involved. And uh, it's a fight that the casuals will, let, will like to see. And it's a fight that the MMA community is praying that Anderson Silva can somehow win and, and upend this hype train, maybe even once and for all. So there are positives and negatives to this story, in my opinion. So one positive, and Zan, you're right, you know, for – what Dana White likes to poke fun at Showtime for not having big fights. And this one, I mean, on the surface, not really a big fight. When you look at Jake Paul, his track record with pro boxing and Anderson Silva and his track record of boxing, but just their star power alone with Anderson Silva being a former UFC champion, MMA legend, Jake Paul being the draw that he is. Zan, you say that this is a fight that's going to bring in the casuals. Yes, it's going to bring in casuals. Yes, it's going to bring in hardcores. But you know what else Jake Paul's fights bring in? The non-combat sports fans. I mean, when you think about it, think about when Jake Paul was teaming up with Triller, when Jake Paul was fighting on 
the co-main event of the uh, Mike Tyson fight at the uh, towards the tail end of 2020, the Triller promotion. That's when you had all the big, you know, music stars. You had Snoop Dogg on commentary doing a concert and then coming back on commentary. Jake Paul kind of brings a different type of audience out, you know, that doesn't limit to those who are fans of boxing or those who are fans of mixed martial arts. Uh, as far as Anderson Silva goes as an opponent, I think this is one that was kind of likely. As you mentioned, Jake Paul has stated in the past he would have liked to fight Anderson Silva, and Anderson Silva has had time in the boxing ring. And yeah, he does, and and he, he does look great when it comes to exhibition bouts, but if I'm not, this is not going to be an exhibition bout, is it? No, no, absolutely not. I'm just saying that he's gotten he's gotten better with age as time is going on. You don't see him like you know looking non-competitive against somebody like Cesar Chavez Jr., for example. Um, is is more so what I meant. It's not like it's not like you know oh, he's in a situation where you know he's one of these older fighters that that is continuing to fight just because they. Need, Need the money. I actually think Silva does this still for the genuine love of the sport, and you have to give him a ton of credit because he doesn't even need to take this fight. He's done everything that he needs to do in his career. He's paid his dues. Um, I think this is just another fight on his resume that he can say, "Yeah, I beat Jay Paul when Jay Paul was, you know, at the height of his prime and whatever." And you know, I just have to ask you this question, and I really don't mean to put you on the spot, but. You know, is this is this a car, you know is this one of those cards where like, you know, are are people are people going to be are people going to be flocking to buy this pay per view in your opinion, or do you think it's going to come down to you know who they potentially stack the undercard with? Because I feel like if you if you if they make the same mistake they did previously with the Jake Paul uh, Hasim Rahman Jr. fight, where it was really that fight and the Amanda Serrano fight. And the whole card gets canceled. That would be another disaster for Showtime because then they'd have to and they'd have to go through that whole process again. So I just want to know: Do you think that one of Showtime's initiatives is to stack this undercard? Because I think if they're smart, they absolutely do. So again, I think Paul versus Anderson Silva is a fight that people will buy because again, attracts boxing fans, MMA fans, casuals, hardcores, and again the non. Uh, combat community, but I do kind of agree with you that Showtime does need to be smart. Like you said, if they get a second Jake Paul fight canceled, and let's be clear, Jake Paul versus Anderson Silva will draw a lot more than Jake Paul versus Hasim Rahman Jr. ever will. So for absolutely. That, so for that, they you're right. They need to, even if they don't completely stack, they need a solid co-main. They need a solid feature fight. They need th – this card needs legs. I would even go as far as to say if they do like a Showtime prelim, like sometimes what PBC does with Fox or UFC does with ESPN, right. ESPN. They, they need a solid prelim feature fight as well. Oh, for sure. And it will just be interesting. Um, I don't know if uh, this has been reported, some of the targeted locations, but uh, – where, where could you see this fight uh, ending up? Because I think I think Florida would be a, a big market for this fight. You could do it. You could do it in Vegas. You could do it back in Ohio, which is where Jake Paul's from. You could do it in LA. Where, where do you where do you see this fight taking place? If you were to, if you were to make a prediction, uh, that's actually a good question, and I think it comes down to one where they think they can draw the most and. Two. Because if you think about because if you think about it, if they do it on October 29th, which is what they're targeting, there's not a big UFC pay-per-view that weekend. The UFC would have already had their pay-per-view from the weekend before. They're mm -hmm. they're more than likely going to have a smaller fight night card, which means all eyes are going to be on Paul versus Silva. So this is this is exactly what Showtime is 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 looking for for sure. Uh, for sure, for sure, and Halloween weekend, and yeah, actually, October 29th, there is a small UFC fight night, the main event, Edson Barbosa taking on Ilya Tapura, so you're right, the, the, the featured attraction of the combat sports world on that night 
for better or for worse, is going to be Jake Paul versus Anderson Silva. And the, the second thing I was going to say comes down to is since this is a professional fight, you know, what commissions are going to approve of Anderson Silva fighting? Like, uh, uh, he looks great in the boxing ring for the bouts that he has had as a late, I'd say mainly the exhibition fight fights, but for a professional fight, you know, it, are, Dan, do you see some concerns that maybe there will be some commissions out there that will say, no, we're not going to let him fight? Oh, yeah, I am a little worried about that. I will say, though, that, you know, if Golden Boy MMA got done Chuck Liddell versus Tito Ortiz 3 and they That's did it in, and they did it in Inglewood, you know, they, they, they got to start looking at commissions, you know, that 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 sanctioned those, you know, I'm not saying that this is a crazy one off. I'm just saying that they, they have to look at commissions that have done these types of fights before, because I can guarantee you that if they bring that to Vegas or they try to bring it to Vegas, they're going to they're going to have some serious issues. Yeah, I would like to say Vegas for the amount of money they can draw, but I don't. Know. I just don't. I just don't see them approving it. They just don't seem to approve. It's like that, just given recent history. They, they don't really. They don't really do that. Right, and I don't think. I'd say I don't think they're going to be worried about money and drawing gates and that. I mean, in a couple of weeks they're going to have Nate Diaz fighting, who typically draws a high number of pay-per-view uh, pay view buys. They're going to have a big UFC in December that's currently topped by the light heavyweight title rematch and maybe potentially John Jones versus Stipe because if a John Jones fight happens in Vegas in December, that's probably going to be a financial success. So I do see, you know, I, I wouldn't rule assuming, Vegas. That's assuming two things. That's assuming, number one, that that fight happens. And right. that's also, and that's also assuming the week of the fight that John Jones can safely make it to Las Vegas because you know Las Vegas and Jones don't really mix them very well. So I, I like your, I like your hypothetical optimism, but we got to be, we got to be careful. Okay, true. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I wouldn't completely rule Vegas out, but a, a California, a Florida, I would probably put ahead of Vegas. You know what else I would put ahead of Vegas? NYC. Madison Square oh, uh, Garden. They technically uh, are owed a Jake Paul fight after watching the Hussein. Of, 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 of course, it would just it would just depend on you know if MSG is open that night and if they, and if they happen to be open that night, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to put that fight there. And I think all the people that were pissed about not being able to go see the Paul Raman Jr. fight will want to will want to go to that fight. And who you know you know as well as anyone. That Showtime and the Barclay Center and Madison Square Garden and those arenas, you know, in that area, you know, they they've associated with Showtime over the last several years, so that makes a whole lot of sense too. So I just looked at the garden. So uh, a couple of the theaters, the Beacon Theater and the Chicago Theater, are booked for October 29th, but I don't think the main room. You know, like you see the UFCs and the WWEs right. held mm -hmm. in. I don't think anything's booked there that night. So that's that's Barclay, interesting. I and I don't know if the Nets are playing at Barclay Center on October 29th. I I think the Knicks and Rangers are either off or on the road on October 29th. So uh, actually, Barclay Center appears to be Nets versus Pacers on the 29th. So if they go to New York, it would have to be at the Garden. Yeah, it would have to be at the Garden, or you could see – could you see that at Nassau Coliseum or no? Mm, I don't know. I, I feel like they're going to want to go to act a pretty big arena. And actually, I just double-checked Knicks Rangers. Yeah, Knicks are off on the 29th. The Rangers actually have a road game in Dallas on the 29th. So the main room's open, so if Showtime wants to strike, now's the time to strike for the Garden. Yeah, they're gonna have to. They're gonna have to do it soon before like a concert gets booked up there or or, or whatever the he says. And then my final question before we get off this topic is, you know, I think this is one of those crossover fights to where, you know, you kind of don't really know like w what happens next. Would you say that if if Anderson if Anderson Silva wins this fight, do you think he retires from combat sports off of a win? Or do you think he keeps doing this? And for Jake Paul, do you think that assuming that, you know, the, the, the Nate Diaz fight, you know, is, is exciting and entertaining, 
you know, could could this could this rumored mega fight between Jake Paul and Nate Diaz actually come to fruition, or do you think that it'll all depend on how the Hamzad fight goes on the tenth? It's a good question. I think if Jake Paul wins this fight, though, unless he wants a tune-up, if Jake Paul wins this fight, unless he wants a tune-up fight, you don't go from Anderson Silva to Hasim Rahman Jr. You're going to want to go to Anderson Sil- from Anderson Silva to Nate Diaz. Uh, as far as what's going to happen with this fight, I don't know. Only because, yeah, Anderson Silva definitely still has some form of power. And Jake, and Jake Paul, and he has a lot more experience than Jake Paul, but Jake Paul is still the younger guy. And Jake Paul can still, you know, move around great and such. Here's my only issue with Anderson Silva is that I don't know if I'm necessarily like I'm impressed for what, it, you know, when it comes to his age, but like his opponent track record, I mean, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., Hot take. I think he is one of the biggest disgraces to boxing. I think he's the big he's a disgrace to his family name. What he has completely fallen off the cliff ever since 2015, 2016, 2017. I'm not that impressed with him. And I think I don't I haven't checked what he's done anything after the Anderson Silva fight, but really I don't care. He should ne- really not be in a boxing ring ever again. Tito Ortiz. I mean, yeah, we all know, we all know how we feel about him. He should, he should have retired years ago. Yeah, and then it was an exhibition fight, like I've mentioned before, that happened in May. So, you know, I'm here's what I'm gonna say. I think Paul still has a chance. I think this is Paul's biggest test, but. I just can't even get over the fact that the WBC tried to even consider ranking Jake Paul on. It's it's, it's it's absolutely absurd. I think it I think it discredits the whole sport when they're starting to to talk about that, considering that as you and I both know, he has yet to fight a legitimate, actual professional boxer. And, uh, and, and, and this, uh, as say, and this fervors the case. Then, like it's a, it's a great right, fight. right. It's a great for the sport financially, but once again. Jake Paul is not he's fighting he's fighting a striker. It's an improvement. He's not fighting an ex wrestler like a Ben Askren or a Tyron Woodley. But again, he's fighting somebody who came into boxing. You know, he had early I think Anderson Silva had earlier boxing experience, but primarily is an MMA fight. Right. He may have only had one one or two professional boxing matches before a year and a half to two years ago, which is crazy. Um but yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. What I'm what I'm just so confused about is Jake Paul continuing to go with this trend of just fighting older, older, not not washed up, but older fighters. And to me, it just it doesn't make sense, and it makes him, in my opinion, less legitimate because he's just is looking to. I I don't know. I think he's looking for names, and he's not looking for actual challenges. Correct. Correct. That's, that, now there is something to say about that, and you know, great, he's going to constantly get the money, which you know, good on him. I'm just saying, if you put him in the ring with a Lawrence Oakley, with an Alexander Usyk, a Martis Bradis, you know, a legitimate, he, he would lose. He would lose all of those. He would get. He would get creamed. He wouldn't even just lose. He would get creamed. He would get stopped. I agree. I don't even think any of the, those names you just mentioned. I don't even think any of those names could that, that he could even last six rounds with them. He probably he probably wouldn't. So so I mean, so, and I think he knows that. So his mission isn't going to be, you know, if he's going to get a WBC belt, it's not going to be the WBC Cruiserweight Championship. It's going to be. One of those silly titles like the money fight, the, the, May, the Mayweather McGregor belt that was made with what? What was it? Like one crocodile, all these ancient jewels. And yeah, it was weird. It was, it, was, it was weird. But I will say this. As far as an early prediction on the fight, I like Anderson Silva via unanimous decision. For some reason, I've got a feeling Jake Paul is going to get the decision or this one's going to end in a draw. I'll laugh if this ends in a draw. Yeah, I think everybody. I think everybody will, and then everybody will be mad that they paid sixty bucks to see it. <laughs> <laughs>
But yeah, let's see. Let's see if this fight actually happens. But yes, according to reports, nothing is nothing is signed yet, but they're inching closer to that date of October 29th. And Jake Paul versus Anderson Silva start to mark your calendars for it because it's going to be here before we know it. So, so what now happened now for Hasim Rahman Jr., Jake Paul's former next opponent? Well, he's also going to fight in October. And he's also fighting an MMA legend. He's fighting Vitor Belfort. <laughs> yeah, uh, this fight just simply doesn't make any sense to me. How about how about you? <laughs> no. Do you remember when Vitor Belfort signed with one championship and the thought was he was going to be doing some fighting? And we just kept waiting and waiting, waiting <laughs> and waiting <laughs> and then nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. And yeah, I mean, now he, now, you know, he's going into this weird next phase of his career where he's, you know, he's trying to be a legitimate boxer and just, you know, him fighting Hasim Rahman Jr. isn't it. He's, and he's going to, he's going to get outclassed. It's, it's, it's that, it's that simple. He's not the same Vitor Belfort that he was 13 years ago when he was trying to, you know, regain his form as one of the best fighters in the middle of division he's just not he's just not the same guy again one of those guys that should have retired years ago this should be an easy win for robin jr in my in my in my opinion agreed agreed it should be and also i mean at least with jake paul and anderson silva you know like i said with the kind of audiences that jake paul attracts it's going to be a financial success for showtime <laughs> either way even if the main event ends in some screwy finish here you know, Hasim Rahman Jr., who pulled out of the Jake Paul fight, Vitor Belfort, who, again, was a, is also an MMA legend, but hasn't fought really in years, hasn't gotten any attraction, you know, big headlines in a while. This one's not going to draw well. No. Oh, no, it won't. But I think the lucky part is that it's on the zone, so you don't have to worry about pay-per-view buys as much. But, yeah, just the, just the draw and appeal won't do as well. Yeah. No. Uh, see, the fact that it's the zone makes me feel a little better that I'm not going to have to fork over a whole lot of money for this. But Agre agreed, same here. I'd say, but still, you know, if there's something like a UFC, hell, if it's going to happen the weekend of WWE Extreme Rules, I'd rather watch one of those. I don't know if that, this holds up on the interest on the interest uh, scale. I, I don't yeah, think it does. Right. Yeah, I mean, it also depends on what time the fight starts. I mean. If the fight starts at eleven forty by me, there's no way I'm gonna stay up and watch that. Or you, or you, or you. I would rather, I would rather wait for Twitter to tell me what the heck, what the heck happened. Yeah, but yeah. I, the, this just, this just isn't a fight that I really, that I really care about. When I saw it, I'm like, who wants to, who wants to see that? Who in the right mind thought this would be a good idea? Because it's simply not a good idea. No, and to zone, by the way. I mean, the Mighty Fall, that platform has just... I, I've barely used it. I've used it to watch... I said the last time I've used it were the two heavyweight title fights between Usyk and Joshua, I think. Oh, interesting. Did you not use it for Canelo versus Bivol? Did I use... Oh, no, I did use it for Canelo Bivol. You're right, you're right. Okay. You're right. I, I forgot and then you'll and then And then you'll have to use it for Canelo Golovkin 3. Yeah, it's it's funny, Zen. It's it's funny. Remember when Canelo versus Golovkin three was always the big talking point, and it kind of still is. But it just seems like doesn't yeah, it doesn't I, feel as big as it should be. Yeah, I mean, it should have technically happened in twenty nineteen, and it is when and now now it's like now it's like the fight doesn't even matter anymore because both are super old and HBO's out of the business now, and the fight just doesn't feel as big as. Was first to with them being on HBO and then being on big stages and it, Canelo it just, losing to mm -hmm. Canelo losing to Bivol, Golovkin. I think you said 2019. I think back to October his fight in October 2019. He should have lost that fight. Mm -hmm. I, I, it it doesn't have the same kind of appeal, and it's kind of sad. Agreed, but hey, good for Eddie Hearn though. He's promoting a massive fight. This. Is this, this just goes to show what what a hell of a year that Eddie Hearn has had as a promoter, and that fight should do very well. And what's great about that fight is they don't have a big UFC to to really worry about. 
that same weekend because the UFC would have just come off from 279 the week before that. That's so true. all all in all, the zone does have some interesting fights coming up, but they have a, they have a lot of fights that are suited for a lot of different types of people that maybe aren't as big of hardcore fans or observers as maybe you and I are. So that's true. All right, let's get to what should have been the big story from this week, other than you know before uh, Jake Paul and Anderson Silva decided to do a run in on our show. Uh, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. He finishes Adriano, Adriano Marias. He is the new one flyweight <laughs> champion. And, well, what can I say? He is still the Mighty Mouse. He is still the flyweight goat, even though one does their uh, flyweight fights at 135, which is technically bantamweight everywhere else. Uh, and, Zan, this fight, there were actually questions heading into, you know, the time between us uh, releasing episode three and the fight actually happening. And that, within that 48-hour span, there were concerns that this fight wasn't actually going to go down because of uh, weight and hydration issues for Marias. Yeah, that, yeah. That's Let alone the whole card, it seemed like, had hydration issues. Right, right, right. But I have to start by mentioning who or who didn't say that Demetrius Johnson was going to win was going to win it was going to yes. in this you, fight I, I, I take another L <laughs> I'm like I just I just don't see a Demetrius Johnson can lose to this guy in back to back fights and sure enough he didn't but yeah yeah this whole card looked like it was going to go into shambles just 24 hours before and thankfully it didn't the card delivered there were some there were some decent fights on it and you know what, man? Demetrius Johnson's knockout was just a thing of pure bliss. And I just have to ask you, too. Like, Demetrius Johnson's been out of the UFC, obviously, since the Ben Askren trade. But I have to know, given the given the, given the the current status of the UFC flyweight division, how would Demetrius Johnson fare in today's UFC flyweight division compared to... Let me start to, by saying I think one championship won the trade. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and for sure. in the UFC. Yeah. It, it Remember might, we thought that was going to be all sorts of excitement? Yeah, it, it was not. It was I not. I mean, it was excitement in, well, he, I mean, he got his ass kicked. He got a uh, flying knee. <laughs> right, by, by a worry, Masvidal. And then Masvidal goes on to have an amazing 2019 and is never the same afterwards. Uh, but in terms of how Mighty – I think Mighty Mouse would still be competitive. Uh, as I said, one championship completely won the trade. The UFC was just waiting for something to basically, you know, throw Mighty Mouse out. And then once he lost the title to Henry Cejudo, which – honestly, that second fight, if you, re if you rewatch it, you know, I could see an argument being made that Johnson should have even won that fight. I thought Johnson won in real time when I when I saw it happen initially. I, I had him. I had him winning. I had him winning the fight. I have not. I get, like gone the fight back was close. Years. You could have. You could have done a trilogy, and I think you know if maybe it wouldn't have drawn well as a pay per view main event. But if you had put it as a co main to say a what was it? That was twenty eighteen. So. If you put it as a co-main, you know, if you had put it on, say, that December card with Jones and Gubson and Cyborg and Nunes, I think would have been fine. I oh, think for sure. Been, I think you could have stacked that with any a Johnson Cejudo three fight on any of those cards in twenty you could have put, 2019. You, you could you could have put it on the uh, you could have put it on the Madison Square Garden card that year uh, with Cormier and Derek Lewis, and I, I think I think it would have done just fine. Yeah. So. And I think if you had put Mighty Mouse Johnson in there with, uh, let's stretch it to featherweight and bantamweight because flyweight's technically one thirty-five. Would you want? Would I want to watch a Johnson Figueroa fight? Yes. Would I want to watch a Johnson Moreno fight? Yes. Would I want to watch Jones versus uh, Johnson versus Dillashaw? Hell yeah. Would I want to watch Johnson versus uh, Aljamain Sterling? Hell yeah. I, I, uh, absolutely. I, I still see Johnson as a draw, and I still see him as a pound for pound great. Oh, I know? mean, out of the, out of those four names that you just mentioned, at least two of those you could easily run back three times and be satisfied. At absolutely. least, at, at least two. But absolutely. yeah, I, I, I just, I just think, you know, I just saw 
it's weird. The Johnson who fought Adrian Moranis the first time and the Johnson who fought Adrian Moranis the second time. Completely different. Yeah, and I could even say the same for Adrian Moranis. It, it was two completely different fights. So I don't know if Moranis was exhausted from the hydration and weight cutting issues or if Johnson maybe misjudged Moranis the first time. Right. Do you do a trilogy off of this fight or are you not interested? I wouldn't mind it. It's not the most exciting, most tempting kind of trilogy, but I wouldn't mind it. And, and I mean, I mean, do you, could you envision Demetrius Johnson staying with one championship for the rest of his career? I, or, or, or could you ever envision a time where he returns to the UFC? I think because I think I think he's one of those draws where you could slide him right into a title fight and people would be people would be excited. I agree, but I don't I just don't know how much interest Dana has. If Dana was so willing to ship him off to one championship for Ben Askren in 2018 after one loss like we kind of implied was kind of controversial, was he would he really want him back? And Dana Kind of, you know, how we feel about him wanting to admit defeat. He never wants to do it. You know, I mean, we, we, I mean, besides, besides him saying that they effed up when they didn't re-sign Shane Burgos. Shane Burgos. That's really the one time. You see fans and media saying all the time, Kyoji Horiguchi, but Dana never admits on that one. And I don't know if he'd want to admit on the Mighty Mouse Johnson. So I really don't know if, if, Mighty Mouse will end up leaving one championship. And here's the thing, Zan. It has to be one championship or the UFC. Bellator doesn't have a flyweight division. Right. At least not, at least not for and the men. He wouldn't, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't draw in Bellator either. <laughs> that's what I that, that, that's what I, I think. I just don't think Bellator has enough fan interest to bring in Demetrius Johnson to or the Bellator hardcores would really care about it. Or, I don't know. Or, or promotion for that matter. Sometimes right. they struggle with promotion, but you know what? Also the PFL doesn't have a flyweight division and I don't know if they're going to dismantle one of their own divisions for the sake of bringing in mighty mouse Johnson. Now I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, that would of- be, I mean, that would be, that would be the biggest signing in the history of the PFL. If they were able, if they were able to make that happen. That's I, mean, a- I, I mean, maybe, with all the expanding they want to do, maybe they expand the amount of tournament season divisions from like six to eight, put a flyweight in and maybe another women's division in. If you, if they're able to do that, maybe you bring in, if you sign mighty mouse, if PFL signs, mighty, maybe do some, one of these, you know, super card pay-per-view cards you want to do, maybe throw him on that. But I just, I don't know if I see it. For some reason, I see him sticking with one championship unless Dana White is is willing to swallow some pride and bring him back. Well, it'll be very interesting next year to see how this whole flyweight divisional rankings GOAT status picture plays out. But as Demetrius Johnson just re-solidified himself as one of the best flyweights ever, if not the best flyweight of all time. Absolutely. And on the, on the flip, Zan, like I hate to be in the negative, but I think also the stuff leading up to this fight, including with Marias, when it comes to the hydration and the weight cutting, I think some eyes are eyebrows are being raised at one championship. For sure. I mean, what else? What, what else is new? People always question them. Several times, people question the PFL and the way they do things and the way Bellator does things as well. You know, it's one of those leaps and bounds things where none of these promotions are going to be on the level of the UFC. But, you know, now with such a high standard, it's important that these promotions follow suit because they don't want to be put into the bad apples category. And that was something that, you know, one championship tried to avoid, but they couldn't mistake the fact that that did happen the night before a pretty big show and an introduction to all of the Amazon subscribers. Probably not the greatest look in the world that you want to have. No. No, and, you know, especially when you mentioned Bellator and PFL, but especially with one championship, when you say, oh, we care about our fighters, you know, we had that incident in, I think, 2015 where a fighter died due to too much hydra- too much dehydrating for a weight cut. And so we're implementing all these systems that they got to do hydration tests. They got to 
weigh in. You know, we got to monitor their weight as they're weight cutting. You're doing all of this stuff, but still placing everything behind the scenes. So I think more eyebrows are raised more at one championship than say a Bellator or a PFL. I can I can see that as well. Nonetheless, though, big win for him. It'll be interesting to see what one championship does next. And it really does seem like Demetrius Johnson seems to be much happier in one championship now than he ever was when he was with the UFC. So that's, that's great. That's that's great to see. And I, I think that's because, Dan, you know, for all that we talk about with Mighty Mouse and the UFC, I think one championship just appreciates him more. And they'll and they're willing to put him in the main event slot. And now this is and now this is big for one championship. If this next year is really big for not just them, but Demetrius Johnson, because remember the big criticism after Demetrius Johnson left the UFC was that he wasn't promoted heavily enough. This is where one championship needs to strike where the iron's hot. And if they don't think any of the current contenders are good for us for DJ. They're going to have to start to look elsewhere and see what other flyweights could they maybe bring in to, you know, give him that mega fight that he's been waiting for for years. I mean, now if you think about it, I mean, I don't know if this can happen, but I mean, obviously, obviously, you know this better than anyone. Of course, Dillashaw is fighting Sterling. There were talks of Dillashaw fighting DJ when they were both champions of their respective divisions. Mm -hmm. that, that potential fight is still out there if some promotion wants that. That would be that would be massive. So this next year is going to be big for the for the DJ business for sure. I think I think it's a lot of pressure for one championship too because it's been a major letdown ever since. I think I've said I said it on here like last week when we were discussing this that it's been a major letdown for one championship after they had the 2018 early 2019 where they were signing all these talents from Vitor and DJ to Eddie Alvarez, signing Misha Tate to do behind-the-scenes work, and everything has just kind of fallen off of a cliff for this promotion. So this is a year, this next, well, fiscal-style year is one that they got to succeed. Yeah, this might be, 2023 might be the biggest year in the history of that promotion, and I don't even think it's even close. <laughs> they have to... They have to they have to really do some damage if they want to if they want to get back into the good graces of the entire MMA community as a as a top three, you know, major promotion that people can say, yeah, I really do want to watch one championship this weekend, and yes, I do actually hear about the product being put out. So mm -hmm. it'll be very interesting. And I do agree. I think one championship after making those signings, you could have debated putting them above a PFL or a Bellator, but no, I think. I think we're back to UFC, Bellator, and PFL being the big three out there. So oh, great. This, this is going to be a year that they're going to have to rebound. Uh, let's go back to the boxing world for a second, Sam, because this past week we also saw a very weird concept with the zone where KSI fought two opponents in one night, even getting a, a special entrance on the second fight, and he beat both of them. W what do we make of this? Because... I really don't think I'm impressed. I really don't think I, there's been. I mean, I mean, not much. They 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 took a huge gamble and it paid off. So, well, good for good for them on that. But could you imagine if KSI had gotten flatlined in his first to two fights and the second fight doesn't even happen? See, that's the that's the fear. This is why twenty or so years ago the UFC stopped doing exactly this because they didn't want to see fighters get seriously hurt in the same night. And I feel like, you know, I, and I'm not trying to be mean towards any KSI supporters, but I feel like doing this just makes a little bit of a mockery of the sport of boxing because that's not what this sport was based on. Ethically, it's not uh, good because you're putting not not just himself at risk, but his two opponents at risk. Like, like imagine if KSI couldn't come out for the second fight. All of those people that paid to see KSI fight twice now they're now they're stuck in a position to where you know maybe they go home early because KSI isn't fighting again. Like I just I just don't think it was a smart business move. I, I really don't. And then the zone would have been screwed because then KSI is your main event, and now all of a sudden, what's your new main event? It would have reminded me of the time, San, where uh, I think it was Kevin Randleman 
slipped on the ice backstage and the UFC basically had to cancel the fight mid show and didn't they really did. tell anybody about the main event being canceled until they did. And then they moved whatever the co-main event was in the main event and it ended up being awful because nobody knew who the fighters were. And, and nobody, and nobody in the, I think it was the live audience even knew that that was the last fight. They weren't told of uh, the incident until after that fight. So it's like, Oh, uh, show's over. Yeah, fights canceled. Main event fights canceled. Show's over. Go home. And it's, it's sad to say the zone could have ended up in that same situation. For sure. Um, I mean, thank we for them. They got exactly what they wanted. But I really do not want to see any of that sideshow crap ever, ever again. It was stupid. I saw it. It was cool for the moment, but just, just, just silly. We don't, we don't need, we don't need that in combat sports. I mean, there's people as far as, you know, you say we don't need that in combat sports, and yet we have Jake Paul, and unfortunately he's drawing millions. It, Zane, it's sad to say, but it kind of feels like a celebrity white-collar boxing is doing more for the sport than the actual boxers. Which is kind of – which. Is which is really unfortunate and is likely a topic that has not been covered as extensively. So it's going to be interesting to see, like, if this new trend of what of what you're describing, which I would agree with, as as white collar boxing continues, because I think that the people who are tuning in don't truly appreciate the pure artistry that the sport actually is. So when these big fights happen. I just don't think there's the same level of fanfare than maybe these celebrity one-offs that we're seeing now. And, you know, I, I don't know if this is ever going to go away. As Dana White always says, there's a market for that. I'm personally not a huge fan of it. I know there are plenty of people who are. But another sad thing is some of the people who are watching these fights, that's all they that's all they know. They don't know that, like, there are these other massive fights between the legitimate boxers. They to see what they see on social media, and they think of that as the sport. That that, that kind of be further from the truth. Yeah, like I want some of these people who would only tune in for Paul versus Silva. Show them Usyk Joshua two. Show them Canelo Triple G three. You know, show them the awesome fight from I think it was twenty nineteen between uh, Spence and uh, Sean Porter. Show right. them that stuff. I feel like there are some out there who are show him, to show him, fans. Show them Wilder Fury one. Show them any of the Wilder Fury fights. Right. Like there, you know, there's still, you know, for all the problems we talk about with boxing, for all the white collar celebrity bullshit that seems to have taken over the sport and is outdrawing the actual fighters. Which, which be, right, which to be fair, the stuff that we are talking about is technically bullshit because it's overshadowing all of the other fights that are actually legitimate. Like the one coming up in November with, with, with Crawford and, and Spence. Like that fight, that fight should should be getting the attention that Jake Paul and Anderson Silva will eventually get. That's what that's what's wrong with the sport is the priorities of some of these fights that should be big aren't big enough because people just, they don't care for whatever is because they're made to think that these celebrity fights are it when they're, when they're not. It's the unfortunate draw of, you know, allowing celebrities to enter the sport. And unfortunately in the case of Jake Paul kind of entered the sport, you know, on a professional, well, professional level considering the fighters that he's facing, because again, he hasn't faced a legitimate boxer yet. Right, which, which, if I were to guess, that'll more than likely be the case within the next six or seven months. And we're going to be talking about, about the same topic again. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. All right, but it's not just boxing that we have issues with. So here's a big question for today. Now, I have to give credit to... You, Zen, and I have to give credit to your pal here, uh, Mr. Ben the Bane Davis. Uh, computer froze for a second, okay. Who brought this topic up on social media. Actually, there's your reply right there in the front. 
talking about what are some of your issues with the UFC. So UFC, obviously, the top promotion in the world. Yes, there are other promotions out there, and that's great for free agency and such, but UFC is the one that constantly gets attention. But there, it isn't perfect. You know, we tune in every weekend. We watch all the fights, but there can still be ways that the UFC can be better. So, Zen, do you want me to uh, read yours? Do you want me to? Do you want to explain yours already? Yeah. Now? So, yeah. So I'm just going to explain. So, um, for those of you guys who don't know, Ben the Bane Davis is a MMA Twitter personality. He's around my age. He just graduated from Arizona State. He just eclipsed uh, 10,000 Twitter followers probably about a week and a half ago. For those of you guys who don't know, he makes some pretty hilarious original content that has gone a little bit viral. And this is another one of his tweets that has sparked up some interest. And it is, what are some of your issues with the UFC? And um, I have several, but one, but one issue that I never see on Twitter being discussed or really anywhere is the one that I talked about. So as you guys know, when you purchase ESPN Plus for the UFC, that's the only way in the United States legally that you can watch the pay-per-views. So my issue is that back in the day, you used to be able to watch the UFC events on cable. You used to be able to buy them. You used to be able to DVR them. And now they've completely taken that entire functionality away. So let's say somebody who's been a UFC fan for years doesn't know or which streaming totally is, has only ever been used to buying the pay-per-views. For the last three years, they have not been able to do that. My biggest issue is why not give people the option uh, to, to buy the UFC events without having to continuously use ESPN Plus if they don't want to. And I just feel like if boxing has something similar to where you can still buy the fights on your regular television, and, and they're under the same company of ESPN, I really do think that that's something that needs to be addressed in some way because not everyone is going to be able to stream it. There's been fans that have, that have been around for a long time that are that are likely older than you and I and mm -hmm. probably and probably can't do the streaming thing that we like to do. So that's one of my biggest issues outside of the obvious fighter pain, what have you. I just wanted to say something a little bit different and not and not trendy amongst the rest of the crowd because that is actually a topic that I feel strongly about that needs to get addressed in some way and there's no way UFC doesn't know that this is some sort of an issue now the only way that you can watch the UFC on cable quote unquote is if you go to a bar because they have a special distribution to where they're still able to buy them through the TV but yeah that's one of my biggest issues with the UFC at the moment that's not one of the one of the many trendier topics as of late in 2022 how about you and and Sam I think you are on the ball, I think one that's barely talked about. You know, you 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 just said before, uh, you know, you or I kind of like the streaming. Yeah, except when you're having a bad internet night and it constantly goes out, or ESPN Plus fucks up and just crashes for everybody. <laughs> right. I have some great experience with that. Me, me too. Me too. So it's frustrating and you know what you are right i it would i guess be great for the ufc if we could have and great for us if we could have you know the espn plus option or if we could have the option to watch it on traditional pay-per-view outlets and, and you know what you know what else is an issue every year the pay-per-view price goes, goes up. up every year it goes up like five to ten bucks every year, which means more money that you or I or anybody else covering this sport or anybody who's a big mega fight fan and wants to watch everything, more that they have to more that they have to shell out. It's kind of unfair on the fight fan. It's kind of no, unfair on those no, who, you know who don't get their ESPN plus or anything like that covered for them. Constantly have to shell out to have access. So that way they can cover. I mean, think about this, Dan. WWE Network, which is now part of Peacock. They have, they, they, they they have set everything. the correct model that you pay whatever it is per month and you also get the the big events. You know, it's not like UFC where 
on top of your fight pass and your ESPN plus, you have to also pay for the event and you don't even really get much of a discount if any at all on it. I was just going to no, say, no, unless you're, unless you're super lucky to scan one of those QR codes that they have in the middle of the pay-per-view and maybe you'll get a little bit of a discount or maybe a free pay-per-view code, maybe. but that's, but that's like a one in 1000 chance that you actually get it. But yeah, I, yeah. And then people, you know, revert to, uh, to, to other ways, which I won't get into specifics as to, as to what those are, but now more and more people are reverting to other ways to watch them because they don't want to shell out all the money that it takes to, to, to buy the legitimate thing because they're worried it isn't going to work. And, and, and what's crazy and, is that the, you, the same feed that you and I get works better in some other countries than it does in the United States. Right. Where they get where they get no lag whatsoever. And then, <laughs> and then also the 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 only other side to that that's kind of that is I don't think really because the reason that the uh, let me start over the ESPN uh, plus stuff the fact that you know what's missing Zen all the pay per view buy numbers those rarely ever get out now because they're just either one kept so secret or two you know people like say a dave Meltzer, who always reported who reports on cable you know when he's not or, covering wrestling he'll report or, on or jedi or, 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 or jedi goodman or jedi or jedi goodman jed goodman too that the right. fact is unless you know it somehow can get out or the ufc comes out with it you know like when they were on traditional pay per view only, there would be reports. Okay, this card got three hundred thousand buys. This card got five hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand, one million. We don't get those kinds of things, those kinds of reports anymore. And dare I say, Zan, I don't think the UFC cares. They probably have so much money from this ESPN deal from the time they signed it in twenty eighteen. And the amount of money that they'll get from ESPN per year, I don't think they give a shit. Or I don't think they have to give a shit. I don't think so either. But what I think is crazy is that even when you look at other platforms like the zone, very rarely do you have to pay to watch the pay per view. They they maybe have one or two just quote unquote the zone pay per view cards a year, and the rest of the zone you can just watch. And the only so, reason, Zan, we have even those pay-per-view cards, in my opinion, for the zone is because the zone itself didn't get enough subscribers. And like I kind of mentioned before, the platform kind of unfortunately has flopped. Right. But what I just think is crazy is that you have the WWE network and you can get everything on that with one subscription. And I mean everything, but you can't do the same thing with any of the major MMA promotions. And it like just I said, is. And like I said, Zan, this is not something that's unfamiliar because those who signed up for UFC Fight Pass in the mid-2010s, you would think maybe they would have gotten a discount on UFC pay-per-views, but no. It just – like, and it doesn't make sense how you can't watch the UFC Fight Pass broadcast as an alternative. If you don't, if you don't want to watch the, the, the ESPN feed, which, by the way, in case you haven't you – have like actually watched if you've never watched a fight pass feed like in full before it might be the best ufc experience you've ever had you get you get no commercials you get every single entrance to every single fight or and so all of the entrances that 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 you don't see on uh on the prelims for the espn uh for the espn plus cards you get all those it's almost like the rest of the world on Fight Pass, they're getting the better experience than the people stateside. I agree. You know, and then other issues, like you kind of said, I mean, not that these aren't important, but they're just covered, you know, constantly covered by bigger people than you or I, covered by people who under maybe understand that side more than you and I. The fighter pay, e even if not the fighter pay, the win you know the show money win money structure which i actually said a couple of weeks ago kind of outdated something and rooted in boxing that kind of needs to change you could talk about 
judging, which goes on, which goes beyond the UFC. That goes towards the uh, different athletic commission. The UFC, the UFC ranking system is an other issue. So, so, sometimes the ranking system is so skewed that you don't even you don't even know where to start. Correct. Although. Mm-hmm. You know, so although that's with any promotion, like Bellator has their own rankings, and sometimes make right. questionable decisions, like when uh oh, like when putting uh when putting um uh Bevlin um who won the title against Gracie below um contenders, for example, and uh. Oh, what's her name? Valerie L- Valerie Leda, she got whooped, and then the opponent was like ranked number nine, and she was still like towards the top. That didn't make any sense. No. No, it does not. But but that also means that the MMA media has to be more responsible in how they rank these fighters because you can't mislead people. And that's what Bellator's biggest issue has been, is their rankings have been very misleading for the last several years, and you just can't do that as the number two promotion in the world. No. Uh, what other issues with the UFC? So, oh, uh, healthcare, obviously, caring for mm-hmm. fighters post career. There should be improvements in that. But again, that's stuff that has been covered and will continue to be covered. But yeah, I think for the sake of you and I, for something a little different. The ESPN Plus experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, yeah, I'd say the ESPN Plus experience is big, and the oversaturation of too many cards. Too yeah, many well, cards. That's, that's stuff that's been going since the Fox. Where I'm not trying to underplay, but I'm just saying that's stuff that's been going on since the Fox Sports days. Actually, the when the 151 got canceled. Actually, they weren't even on Fox yet. That was still during the Spike TV era. No, when no no 151 would have been Fox because 151 was in 2012, and he signed with Fox in oh, 2011. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, yeah, right, right. that is Fox. That is Fox. I I kept mm-hmm. thinking I was thinking of Fox Sports One. They that they didn't debut. Yeah, they hadn't. Yeah, they hadn't. Yeah, they hadn't been on FS1 yet because that didn't come out until 2013. Yeah, but that was still a Fox. That was still Fox era. You're right. R- r- right, 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 exactly. Fox era. Yeah, um, I just think the quality, what, my whole point is the quality of even the prelims was significantly better five or six years ago, arguably, than it maybe is today. Where I feel, where I feel like you know more to the fighters now. Correct. Well not, well, not now, but you knew more to the fighters back then than you do now, it's where now it's like you can't even keep up with over 40% of the roster because they just don't fight as often enough for the turnover. I think yeah. fighting, if you know that documentary fighting in the age of loneliness, that's secret based it. If you guys out there haven't watched it, you got some must watch. It's out. And there's also, I don't remember who made the video, Tom, but there's also a video about um, if you watch every UFC prelim for a year, are you really missing? a good majority of the card and the conclusion to that answer was no. You're really, you're really, you're really not. Um, uh, what happened was the guy ran the numbers and he basically determined that like there are very few prelims that you might actually care about. And actually the history of UFC prelims goes all the way back to UFC 20, believe it or not, which is pretty, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. There was all this demand, you know, I'd say around, late 2000s, early 2010s, you know, they would never air the prelims, but people wanted it. And so, unless you, um, unless you stayed up after the main event, or watch whatever on your prelims, they would show afterward. Correct. And then, and then people want, and then people wanted more fights. So then they went, okay, let's do the Facebook thing where you like the, the Facebook, Facebook prelims. Oh, yeah. Yeah. God, you, you, so. yeah you, had to, you had to, you had to like the Facebook page and you got, like two singular fights, and you didn't know what those fights were until the until the day of. And then there was more demand, and they were like, "Oh, we want more fights." And then they were like, "Okay, let's let's put on four fights on TV." And then the fans are like, "No, we want we want we want the entire preliminary cards." So once the FS1 deal started, they're like, "Okay, let's hear, let's hear the entire card." <laughs> and, and then in the horrible pacing issues that FS1 brought with it. Yeah, thankfully ESPN is a lot better than FS1's pacing. Thank goodness FS1's pacing was downright terrible. Um, but 
that's a topic for another day. I would say my biggest issue for sure is the ESPN Plus experience. And then, of course, maybe just maybe scaling back on the number of fights per weekend. But otherwise, again, I'll... Again, I don't think that second one is ever really going to no, happen. Because, no, and no, it, I know. it correlates with number one because I don't think the UFC... You know, they get so much money from ESPN that I don't think they really have to, have to care about no number, of course fight, number of fight cards and all that for sure uh but yeah i'm not the biggest fan you know it seemed exciting at the time but i'm not the biggest fan of the ufc espn experience i'm not either and there just doesn't seem like you know it's not like fight pass where like they have the dedicated fight pass cards and it was like okay here's what's on fight pass Here's what's on FS1. Here's what's on pay per view. It feels like every single card is exactly the same. And it was just presentation. By the way, that was another shocking thing. When they went to ESPN and I saw, oh, they took out like the, the UFC Fight Night graphics. I'm like, wait, so every single card is going to have the same graphics package? That's what I was confused about. So I'm like, okay, so every single card looks like it's a pay per view? That doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Because you would you would distinguish the graphics with the type of card UFC had, and the, mm -hmm. and once the ESPN deal happened, they decided to make it uniform. It's like now every card doesn't feel the same. Now you do, now you don't remember specifically what card what card it was. Right. I mean, I mean, do you remember when they did the UFC uh, anniversary show where they basically? They, they they did in Colorado. I think it was 2018 for the yeah, 50th anniversary, I, I, and they I, they used the old school graphics. Yeah, which was which was pretty awesome. Like 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 that was cool. Maybe we should have more of that. Well, maybe well well, well maybe they will do it because this year it's November 12th. November 12th, Madison Square Garden. Yeah, but I mean it's a pay per view, so maybe they won't do the old school graphics. Unfortunately, you never you never know. They might make they might make a tribute video. Oh, because it will be the anniversary. That'll be that'll be cool. That would be now, that would be cool. Actually, that next would, year next year's the thirtieth anniversary. Yeah, that'll be that'll be that'll be big. It's crazy how young the sport actually is. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, it'll All be right. definitely interesting to see if the, if they take any of the fans' advice on Twitter because. Apparently, the last several years, in terms of viewing experience, they just simply haven't done so. So, yeah, and I've got a feeling that they continue to won't do so. All right, Zan, I, I think it's time we finally get into the big talks. Let's get into uh, UFC Paris here. Of course, UFC Paris. It is the first time ever that the UFC has entered the Paris sphere. September 3rd, this coming Saturday, prelims at 12 noon Eastern and the main card at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Our main event, Cyril Gaon, coming off his unsuccessful challenge of Francis Ngannou back in January, taking on Tai Tuivasa. So the Tai Tuivasa actually coming off a pretty big victory, one that got him ranked to number four in the UFC rankings. So we got number two versus number four. Oh, then that's a worldwide topology rankings. I apologize, but still we got probably, this is a top five contenders fight, and this could go ways towards what could happen in the heavyweight scene, especially if, you know, Jones versus Stipe doesn't happen, especially if Francis Ngannou and the UFC don't come to terms on a new deal. This could be a very pivotal fight, a very huge main event for the UFC's first ever trip to Paris. This is my upset pick of the week. I actually really do like two of us in this one. I like him to come into Paris and spoil the party. This is my this is my upset pick of the week. I think two of us is the hottest heavyweight that doesn't have a title right now, and I and I just think I just think Gon is not going to be ready for the power. Because if this fight stays standing, it's going to be very, very interesting. So oh this my is my God, Sam, right the, off the, the bat. <laughs> right off the bat, you're not even waiting to give a best bet. Here it is. You're upset. This is my. This is my. This is my upset pick of the week, and this might actually mean my MMA upset pick for the month of September is tied to Avasa at plus four hundred. <laughs> oh man, ah. <laughs> uh... I mean, that's the thing, though, that you mentioned. This fight 
it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting because because um because I just think it's one of those fights where it's purely striker versus grappler. Yeah, if, if this fight goes it, to the ground, it's going to be interesting to see how Tui Vasa responds. Although Gan Gan could be a decent striker himself. Don't count out his strike. Don't count out Gan striker. No, I no I no I agree. Another pick that I like is the is the uh, is the under at two and a half rounds. That's one that the, that's one that I could see happening if you want to Avasa to win. But if you're if you're on if you're on the side of God, then you got to go opposite. You got to say that the, the, the over two and a half might be might be might be the way to go. Look at you, Zan, just firing them all out there. <laughs> Zan, with Zan is in the zone this week. When it yeah, I, to, yeah, to I've been, I've been, I've been analyzing this fight for a week. I'm like, I just, I, I, I can see, I can see some people, I could see some people going, going berserk this weekend based on how, based on how this fight goes. And I, I just, I just think that two of us is level of confidence ever since he knocked out Greg Hardy and UFC 264 has been just, just, just immense. He's become one of the most popular fighters in the UFC heavyweight division. He's on a really nice win streak. I, I mean, was just I mean, say, he hasn't lost in three years. He hasn't lost since losing to Spivak. He beat Struve. Struve, decent win. Uh, it's a Hunt decent Sucker. win, but Struve was Struve was on the downside of his career. Right. Though. That's the only thing. Downside. Hunt Sucker, kind of downside. Greg well, Hardy. Well, but I mean, Augusta Sakai and Derek. Stu- Lewis. And two two studs back like to that, back. Like the fact that it's okay, the first three wins, yeah, you could easily write off. Spe- uh, Sakai and Lewis, I don't know. That five fight win streak now all of a sudden looks really, really legitimate. And for what I said about you can't count out the striking ability of Cyril Gunn, you can't count out the power that uh, Tai Tuivasa brings. And really, we didn't see Gunn take any power. From Francis, Francis Ngannou, Ngannou, because, which is because Ngannou which is, wrestled him, which is which is shocking because everybody thought, oh, if Francis catches him with something, he's going to go to sleep, and that didn't that didn't happen. So well, that, it didn't happen because we never got the opportunity to see it because his right exactly. And, and, and you have to give Ngannou all the credit in the world transitioning, you know, focusing on his grappling, which was a pretty big weak point, and then you know focusing all his training on that and doing nothing. But that in the championship fight because he actually screwed up his knees. That was an incredible performance by Ngannou. So this is a big rebound test for Cyril Gunn. But this is the biggest opportunity of Tuivasa's career. And you know what, Zan? I think I'm going to go with you. I, I Now that you're on the Tuivasa train hyping him up and I was thinking about it, like I wasn't sure, I've been worried about Gunn possibly, you know, like I said, out-wrestling him. I, I I might be with you. I might be with you on Tui Vasa winning this. Yeah, game. yeah. I just I and I don't and I don't see how this goes the goes the distance either. Or so if you want it, if you want it, if you want to pick a safe bet, take I this does not one, go the distance prop. Take this one to not go. It's not to, to not go the especially if you're especially if you're a tied to him as a fan. That's something that you don't want to see happen anyway because Tui Vasa is much more entertaining when he's dropping people and putting them on the canvas. But I have to say, if it wasn't for this main event, Tom, this co-main event and between Robert Whitaker and Marvin Vittori could easily headline this card as well. You have Robert Whitaker, the former UFC middleweight champion, as, as fought Israel Adesanya, Marvin Vittori, very similar story for him as well. He's also fought Israel Adesanya. They're both two of the best middleweights in the world, number two versus number five in the at weight class. It's a, it's a fight. This might be Whitaker's last chance to try to get his all back, um, assuming he wins this fight. And for and for Vittori, you know, this is one of those fights where he really needs to get another win under his belt because he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to be on a losing streak. And out of his out of his last three appearances, this is just overall a big fight in itself. Just to see where the landscape of the middleweight division goes, uh, I, I I like Robert Whitaker to win to win a decision here. I, I agree. I think Whitaker, you know, for what we've seen for Vittori, you know, I mean, Vittori, he technically wouldn't be on a losing streak because he does have the win over Paulo Costa. But again, like we kind of implied last week, that was at light heavyweight. 
you know, because Paulo Costa couldn't keep his weight under control. And so Marvin Vittori is coming off of that win, but not the strongest kind of win. Didn't necessarily have the best performance against Israel Adesanya. And and it was the second time that they fought the first time for the title. The first time that they fought wasn't for the title, but you know, Whitaker, you know, even though he clearly lost to Adesanya that second time around, he put up a hell of a fight. He was in it from opening bell to final horn and everybody else in the middleweight division, like we kind of implied, Sam, he's run through. Absolutely. And if you think about it, Whitaker was really the only one to give Adesanya during his title reign so far the toughest test, which is which was in that rematch. And some people thought Whitaker did enough to win that fight. Of course, the judge didn't think so. But, you know, again, it's one of those fights where whoever wins and assuming Adesanya beats Pereira, he could be he could be next in the line for either of them. The fight that's way more appealing, of course is a trilogy between Whitaker and Adesanya. Right, but I don't know if the UFC would necessarily go for that unless they didn't really have, you know, much of a choice. I mean... I mean, I just feel like... I mean, I mean, do you really think that if Adesanya beats Pereira, that, that, that like... I mean, I mean, what else would they do with him at that division? That would be the... That would be, that would be the only... Deal. Yeah, that would be the only question. I mean... If Adesanya, I mean, Ad, we've already tried the Adesanya moving up to light heavyweight experience, and you know that hasn't really worked. But it, do you think Vittori or Whitaker are really going to get you know a title shot with a win here? I like, I could see it, but I, I think I, I, I think I think Whitaker is a better chance if he wins compared to compared to Vittori. Right, and I, and I think if Pereira. Beats Adesanya, they'd probably do a rematch. They'll have to do. They'll they'll have to do a rematch for sure. But but if the winner of this fight is willing to wait it out, or they take another fight and win another fight against you know, uh, a Derek, a a Derek Brunson, Brunson. Uh, Strickland, Hermanson, then maybe I could see whoever wins this fight being the first post Adesanya challenger for uh, Pereira. I could see that as well. But yes, I really do like Whitaker in this one. I like Whitaker to go the distance or stop and wait. I just think that he has too many tools, way too much experience, has been in the bigger fights before. This is a fight that... This is a fight that... Yeah, go go ahead. I was going to say, and like we said kind of Whitaker has run through every the one person that Whitaker has not been able to stop and you can, like you said kind of debatedly enough is Israel Adesanya the guy who holds the championship right so there's that and I agree with you I would go with uh Whitaker here by decision and you and honestly that would be my uh that would be my lock of this week Whitaker by decision interesting uh, um, what what other what other fights on the card intrigue you? Um, uh, J- John McDessie is also pretty exciting. Yeah, has been around watched, for a while. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't watched John McDessie, he can be he's a nice guy and he can actually be quite entertaining. And he's actually taking on Nasrat uh, Hakpars, which honestly, that fight on paper sounds that sounds fun. It does, but it's a very dangerous fight for. For hack rest, considering that you know he, you know he's um, he's lost three of his last five. I know, right, right. He's lost three of his last five. And w- would you say McDessie is the biggest name he's ever fought? One of, if not the, yeah. And McDessie, you know, he might be ten years older, but we've seen him be able to still go. And mm-hmm. another fight that really has my interest: the return of Charles Air Jordan taking on Nathaniel Wood. That's a fun featherweight fight. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, Charles Charles Jordan. You know, he's trying to you know recapture the Canadian MMA scene. Nathaniel Wood has been a prospect that people have looked at for a really long time. This is one of those crossover fights to where you know whoever wins, you know, maybe breaks into the top fifteen. To where whoever loses, you know, maybe they have to go back to the drawing board and and win and and win a couple fights. 
you know, to get back to that echelon to where to where they could be fighting in a bigger spot. It's a really, it's a really a featherweight fight. And it's a featherweight fight that I think a lot of people are uh, are just simply overlooking just because of how good the top two fights are. And who doesn't right. like and who doesn't like watching um, Joaquin Buckley? And either he, he's also he's a, also a fun guy, a fun guy to watch too. And, um, but he's got, but he's got a pretty tough test in uh, Nasser Dean Imavov. Yeah, that yeah, that's gonna be. That's gonna be he. You know, um, even even is probably the best fighter that Buckley's ever fought. And he's got to be super careful to not get caught with something super early in that fight. That's for that's for sure. And I think going back to uh, the Jordan Wood fight, the only other problem that you said people overlooking because both have two losses in their last four, so both are looking for a win. But like you said, they're both very talented that they could get into top spots i mean you know the up to the featherweight rankings the top 15 and actually before hope before buckley goes in there benoit saint denis also another guy that i like but he's taking on uh another tough test in uh gabriel miranda yeah i mean for those of you guys have not seen a benoit fight this is the fight to watch he's super action packed he goes for he looks for the finish same thing. Same thing with Miranda. I actually like this fight not to go the distance. Yeah, I like this fight not going the distance as well. There's a reason Santini is called the God of War. And if you have not seen Santini fight, and you are interested in watching the card on ESPN Plus this weekend, you'll find out why he's called God of War. Oh, one, one hundred percent. We don't want it. We don't want to reveal it until oh, until after until after next week, assuming he. And, but this is a guy that's must watch TV whenever he whenever he fights. Also, uh, one I want to mention before we go away for here, uh, feature prelim, Dustin Sol Dustin Solzfus taking on. I hope I'm going to pronounce this right, Abasupian Magomedov. So Dustin Solfus at mm -hmm. one point was considered you know somebody to watch out for, although he has lost. Uh, three of his last five, he just snapped a three-fight losing streak. Yeah, and this is a this is a must-win for uh for for Stolzis for sure. I mean, it's a must-win, but I I he he has two a two uh inch reach a disadvantage in height, a th three inch uh disadvantage when it comes to the reach, and he's taking on uh a twenty-four four and one fighter who's won three of his last four. It's actually uh, hasn't dropped four of his last five. He had a draw, win, loss, win, win. Uh, and you know what we say about the Magomedovs? Very tough on the ground. So Stolfus, this this might not look. This might be it for him. This doesn't look good for him. No, not not even not even in the slight. And so to recap, um, to recap the 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 two bets that I like are are Whitaker Vittori to go the distance. And I also like the upset of uh, Tai Tuivasa to beat Cyril Gan in the main event. Those are the those are the two that I'm the most confident in. And then, of course, uh, um, the the the, um, the same uh, Ben Denise fight not to go not to go well, the distance. Those would be those would be my three. If I were if I were to part away any of them together, I would part away Whitaker uh, by decision and the. And to only fight uh, not to go the distance, and then uh, as a single, I would, I would, I would, I would take, uh, I would take two of Vasa. I kind of like that. I'm, I'm good with that. Vinar, that is your MMA Outsiders best bets of the week. Yeah, and if you were, and if you were to be a crazy degenerate, you could probably parlay all of them, and it would probably be like plus eight hundred or something like that, and you could probably win a decent amount of money. Here's hoping that our bets for this week go well, Zan. Here's hoping. Yeah, considering that uh, a couple weeks ago, let's just say they didn't go very well. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the MMA Outsiders. Don't forget to follow us across social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, MMA Outsiders ETB. Make sure to follow us across social media at ZanBando99, at Tom's J. Albano, Tom Talk Sports 9. And don't forget to follow the network as well, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and TikTok at ETB Network. 
and make sure you hit that like button one more time. Make sure you hit subscribe. When you subscribe, make sure to ring the bell. That way you get notified for everything here on the Empty the Bench Network from us here at the MMA Outsiders to Game On, from Empty the Bench to Beyond the Bench, Fruity Cereal, Living Life, and so much more. Yeah, thank you guys for tuning in again into this episode of the MMA Outsiders. Again, I'm Zan Bando. You can find my work at vjpen.com. You can find Tom's work at Fansa and in MMA. We are we are so excited to be back again, and we, we really are looking forward to the next week where we will cover everything that is UFC 279. So that'll be so that'll be a great addition. But for now, enjoy the fights. And as a reminder to everyone, be your fight. Oh, yeah. Be Joe Pfeiffer. Be Joe Pfeiffer. All right. For Zan, I'm Tom. We'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. Or, you know what? Since we're going to be in Paris, au revoir. Au revoir.